It's that time, kids. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. We are back. <laughs> Whether you wanted it or not. <laughs> That's right. I don't know if it's by popular demand or not, but we are here. So you're going to have to yeah. deal with that. Um, we are back. Another episode of the Fire and Ice series. Um, <laughs> it's never not funny, at least to the two of us. At least. So, sitting next to me on screen is my friend Lauren Rosen, licensed therapist out of California, all around a good person. So welcome, Lauren. Well, thank you. And to... Uh, my, well, which side is it on the screen? Left? You're on my left. Oh, no, I'm on the left side of the screen. Doesn't you matter. are on the left side of the screen. So uh, to my left is Drew Linsalata. He's, uh, <laughs> he's an all around fabulous guy. He's got a podcast called The Anxious Truth. He's on the Instagram, the.anxious.truth. He's got books too. And he's studying to become a therapist. So yeah, watch out world. We got stuff, man. We got stuff going on. Yeah. So. Yeah going to take over i'm excited <laughs> yeah it's it's yeah it's all in the works man it's the grand plan. <laughs> so <laughs> wow as i stumble toward the end of this um oh let me turn off my notifications i'm sorry people that was a sound you didn't really necessarily need to hear i liked it yeah that's okay that's a whatsapp notification so um today as is our custom we figured out a topic about two and a half seconds before we hit the record button and uh, so I wrote this morning in my morning newsletter about a uh, guilt and forgiving yourself and that sort of stuff. It was an over, it was a holdover from another episode that I had done of the morning podcast. Uh, and a bunch of people really kind of keyed in on that. And then in my live stream today, somebody said, yeah, but what about when your the thoughts are about something real, like an actual real event? I said, okay, guilt and real event OCD. Here we are. So here, yeah, we're going to talk about that today. I, and I think the two, I, I'm guessing that, Clinically, the two are not really connected. Are they? Are they connected? We, the the guilt and real event OCD. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I actually. So, with OCD, we see, and I'm sure you see this too. People come in and they have, they often have anxiety as the main emotional component, but sometimes it's disgust and sometimes it's guilt. In fact, we see a lot of guilt. And when it comes to real event OCD, I, you know, obviously this is anecdotal, but I, I do see them overlapping quite a bit. And oftentimes it's related to some degree of moral scrupulosity. Mm -hmm. So I did something in the past. And what if that means that I'm a bad person, that I am unforgivable? So, I mean, it, you can see where it dovetails beautifully into feelings of guilt. That makes sense. I guess there's regret in there too. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote this morning about the difference between regret and guilt, because I think there is a difference in, in my opinion anyway. Um, mm. And so I guess there's got to be regret. There's guilt all tied in there. They are related. Yeah. I'm curious to know what, like, I mean, maybe in brief, because I know you've already put out stuff on this, but what, like, what is the differentiation that you make between regret and guilt? Uh, I, to me, regret, and this is the way I conceptualize it for me, is that regret is an acknowledgement that I would like to be able to change something in the past. I can mm -hmm. acknowledge that there's something that I do not like in the past. Mm -hmm. Guilt is sort of a never ending cycle of trying to change it or find some sort of absolution through like self-flagellation. Like mm. I will continue to beat myself up over this in the hopes that somehow that will resolve it or bring mm. me peace or, or get me some absolution in some real or metaphysical yeah. sense. I don't know. Um, yeah. Almost like, um, what's it in Catholic in the Catholic church? I, I should know this. I was, uh, we both raised in the catholic church and i have i have no clue but there you know the the idea of atoning there it is like atonement not that it's exclusive to the catholic faith but that's certainly a, an idea that you're going to do a certain number of hail marys or you know you're going to pray the rosary a certain number of times and then you're free right and i think that that idea is one that really drives a lot of people with you know and it doesn't have to be related to real event ocd but uh, around this concept of guilt. Like you're going to get somewhere by just reliving over and over again, how, how much you dislike a situation. And I, I think one other important discrepancy to make is, the, you know, you talk about regret versus guilt and it sort of reminds me of the flavor of the difference that's talked about between guilt and shame. And Certainly, that's something that comes up in the context of um, of real event OCD and of moral scrupulosity is what if I'm bad, 
right? The difference between guilt and shame being guilt means I've done something mm -hmm. bad that I, you know, would have done otherwise, it, you know, if I had it back to, I could relive it versus shame, which is I am bad. That's good. I not, I was not, had not heard that before. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I don't know who it's necessarily originally from, but Brene Brown talks about it a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so all of that mess is involved when it comes to real event OCD. Mm. Um, do you see a fair amount of real event OCD in your community? Um, there's some, I'm pretty sure. I mean, clearly you can't diagnose anybody on the internet, but but sure. you could find the people who will tell you that they can't seem to get past being anxious all the time because this is a real thing. This, this either really happened in the past or it's a real problem now or a pending problem in real life that demands that they stay in this anxious, hypervigilant, constantly mm -hmm. thinking, constantly problem solving, you know, state. Sure. And oftentimes people will almost offer that as not an excuse because they don't want to be that way, of course, but as almost uh a justification for why yeah. oh, no 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 I, I but but this is different my anxiety is different it's because of this so it's therefore it's real and different yes which we just talked about this in the last episode together of like how the the idea of like this is different and it, it it's no different with real event ocd or with the generalized anxiety that you're talking about right but this is a concern that makes sense given you know, and, and is likely or at least potential. It's not quite as far fetched as maybe some of the concerns that we see in more stereotypical OCD. Um, and so it's warranted. I can't, I'd be, I'd be irresponsible to drop it or I'd be bad to drop it, right? Like it, it, that means something about the degree to which I care about what I did. Yeah. I love the irresponsible thing. That's such a common theme too. It feels so irresponsible mm -hmm. for me to do what, what you suggest that I should do. Like, yeah, it's gonna, you feel like you're being very reckless if you don't tend to this problem. Right. That seems to justify tending to constantly during every week. Yeah. 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 So yeah. real event OCD, is it, I mean, is, does that specify this is a, an event that has passed already or are we talking about it in the past or does it matter? Usually people are talking about a past real event that they are, and it, that's just in my experience of it. I've never, I've not heard it as, oh, well, there's something in the future that we're trying to prep for that's a real event. Um, though these categories are all arbitrary. And I think, again, OCD, generalized anxiety, they're all together on a spectrum. And so whether it's about something in the past or something in the future, you know, it's, it's all the same process that people are going through of trying to make sure something bad isn't going to come to pass or isn't true of the, of historically. I think with real event OCD, because it's usually based in the past, it's generally about like, how do I, how do I resolve this kind of like what you were saying before how do i make space for this to be part of my life so i think that there's a lot of work in accepting dialectics in in that realm people with ocd people with anxiety disorders tend to be very very black and white as you know all too well yeah. and when that happens there's a sense of i'm either good or i'm bad which yes. You know, I don't know about you. I'd be curious to know, actually. I, like, from my vantage point, good and people usually, most people are not good or bad. Oh, no, I would agree with that uh, 100%. You're not either good or bad. Or sometimes right. you're better, sometimes you're, I mean, but there really is, that's such a, this is a little more philosophy than anything else now. Like, what is good, what is bad? We, we can kind right. of agree sometimes societally on universal good and bad, but that's pretty, that's a pretty narrow range of things. Everything else exists in the gray. Right. Totally. Yeah. You're so right. Like so many things are in the gray. So many things um, don't neatly fit into these categories. And even if something, if something is good or bad, if we can all agree on that, at what point does a person then inherently become bad? At what point do they become irredeemable? Mm -hmm. Which I guess is a common concern. Like, this makes me unlovable, unforgivable, unacceptable, unredeemable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it goes, back to, yeah. it, goes, 
No, I was going to say the black and white thing is, is I, I am either good or bad, or this is either completely solved and put to bed, or it is a disaster. There's yeah. no middle ground of like, well, I may never find resolution or I've partially resolved this, or I'm okay with some of it. That yes. there's no tolerance for that middle ground in these situations. No. Yeah. No, don't like things to be like, just sort of like laying out there in the ether unresolved. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I would imagine that's a threat that unresolved uncertainty is a threat. Yeah. And I can't help but wonder sometimes with real event OCD, how much it is about one day this is going to, somebody's going to call me on this. I'm not going to be prepared. I won't have atoned properly. Like I wouldn't, I won't have kept at this. And then I'll realize that I should have been doing that, that sort yeah. of self-flagellation all along. Um, and that I, I really was a bad person. Uh, I was going to say too, I think it, it also relates to Aaron Beck and, and uh, negative core beliefs and this idea of, you know, there's worthlessness, helplessness, and unlovability are those three core and that like that unlovable, that if you really knew who I was, yeah, then, then you would never accept me. Um, it drives us. So um, I think most humans to some degree um, that, that there's this concern about, about being accepted and loved, but then taken to a, an extreme in cases like with real event OCD or, or anxiety about real yeah. events. Real events, whether they're current, future, or in the past, I guess. Yeah. You said something before, like this exists on a continuum, which is what I was wondering about. Is it at some point, and, and I get this question quite often too, like, well, I can't stop thinking about this. Does that mean I have OCD? Does that mean I have, do I have real event OCD because I can't stop thinking about this thing that happened or I can't stop, when do we know? I don't know that it's that simple. I, I think, again, talk about black and white. We like to have these lovely little categories where everyone gets placed and there's the DSM and okay, you fit in the box and then we do this. But honestly, most anxiety, I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters whether we call it OCD or generalized anxiety disorder or health anxiety or well, illness anxiety disorder or social anxiety disorder or a phobia or agoraphobia or so, um, oh my gosh, panic disorder, mm -hmm. you know, you name it. Like I, th those things, they're all the same from my vantage point. Anyway, the, the treatment is identical. We're just talking about different themes and you see so much overlap that I don't know what the benefit is of differentiating so much other than that it's normalizing to people in the very same way that all the subtypes within OCD are, are very normalizing to people, but they're, they're not particularly relevant. That's, you know, yeah, you know, that does make sense. I think it's, <clears throat> excuse me, especially if the subject, if the content, which I know we don't normally care about, but if the content is sort of taboo or on the edges, normalizing, that could be really important. I think. Totally. On Absolutely. the flip side, for somebody who will call themselves an overthinking and I can't get over this and I just carry this guilt. Sometimes there's a fear that, oh, I, now I have OCD. Uh -oh. mm. I have another label, another diagnosis, something else is broken. Uh, yeah. So there's some fear there too. But I like how you said in the end, the treatment is really, it comes down to the same in the end. Yeah. You know, the context might be different. The intentional triggers might be a little different. The methods might be different based on the context, but in the end, the, the principles are the same. So it totally. doesn't yeah. And yeah. so what does it matter if, you know, to, to your point earlier, you're worried about a work event that's coming up in a month and you have to speak in front of people and that terrifies you. So maybe you have like specific social, specific situation, social phobia or social anxiety disorder, yeah. or you're ruminating over and over again about some moment in the past where you said something and you're not sure whether or not you know, it was right or whether or not it was taken out of context or people hate you and you're a bad person. Right. And then you can also see the flavors of social anxiety in there. So it's, you know, yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think this goes beyond disorders to what we're talking about, because I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll share a personal anecdote. Uh, okay. if I may. Sure. Bring it. Um, so as you know, but our, our watchers do not, I recently had back surgery and I think what I noticed, and obviously I have an anxiety disorder. I'm very open about it, but so I guess I'm not necessarily the best test case, but my anxiety disorder is pretty well managed on the whole. But one thing that I noticed 
in the aftermath of the surgery or in the aftermath really of the diagnosis and the, the, the understanding that I required surgery was I should have done X if only I had. Right. And so, and you can see the similarity between, between what we've been talking about, like anxiety about what's going to happen in the future what like something that I did in the past, that's like a, maybe more often than not uh, an event or a, a concrete thing. Um, and, and saying, well, Hey, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to the doctor sooner and I didn't do this. And what if it's my fault? Right. And that impulse to beat up on yourself, it's still, it's been there for me in moments. And I've have to be, had to be like, Oh, wow, look at that bait. That's interesting. Thanks so much. And you know, and do my best not to go down that rabbit hole because, and, you know, I could go through all of the rational reasons why it doesn't make sense to go down that rabbit hole. But I, anyway, I think just hopefully that's illustrative of how this is, this is beyond diagnostic categories. Yeah, I agree. I think everybody, everybody at some point suffers through these things, guilt, totally. regret, rumination, overthinking, that thing that you just can't, I mean, look, and we all have those. I have, I have things from back in my high school years. I have one incident in particular, and I won't, I'm not going to, I can't really share because I, I need to be protect the privacy of certain people, but uh, mm -hmm. it's not, not anything horrible. But in the end, it was really awkward. And I mm -hmm. know that, boy, I did something when I was 16 that ugh, I would have never done when I was 22 or, or 32 or 52. Like I would have known better. Um, totally. And it, it was a stupid thing to do. And every once in a while, I will remember it. For whatever reason, mm -hmm. I don't know why it'll pop back up. I'm like, hey, remember when you did that thing? And I'm like, <laughs> yes, I freaking remember. And there <laughs> is that feeling of embarrassment. Like it's really, and, and it's funny, yeah. it's the embarrassment that I didn't feel then because I didn't know I was wrong then. Yeah. I but now I know. So I'm embarrassed for 16 year old me. Oh. So everybody in the world, I mean, it wasn't disastrous, but nonetheless, it was impactful. And I think everybody, all human beings will have that situation. Totally. It, it happens to all of us. Uh, so, but at some point, maybe it starts to go off the rails a little. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's the difference between, and by the way, I was just awing for little Drew. I mean, little 16 <laughs> year old me. Hey, I thought I had it going on at 16, man. Man, I didn't, but I, I, I look back and I'm still like, Ooh, poor thing. <laughs> um, man, that's a rough, rough yeah. age to be. Oh, I thought I was the shit, but what a dork. Like I could say that. <laughs> now, like, you know, uh, 16 year old he was a dork but that's <laughs> oh, the best yeah. um but yeah and i think you're right everybody has these moments of recollection these sparks of memory and and i have i have some like that too where it's like ooh, right you get that mm, yeah. feeling and i think that is the feeling that is the sort of invitation in for people with real event ocd I don't want that. And I have to fix that. I can't yeah. have, because that's, it's inconsistent with my self image. Like I, that, that doesn't fit with the rest of who I am and my idea of myself. Um, and so, you know, I know we're kind of going outside the context of traditional ERP approaches, but it is in the realm of all or none thinking and, and restructuring in a way, because it's, it's really down to making space for the fact that back what we were talking about before, that we are both good and bad, mm -hmm. that there are things that we will never quite be able to write, um, that we have these stains on our, our good names mm -hmm. and that some people, some people are going to see us as the villain in their stories, which very, I don't know a lot of people who like that anyway, but certainly if, you know, you have any sort of social anxiety, that's like, mm -mm, no. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's an unavoidable fact of life for almost everybody. Somebody's yeah. going to have a problem with something you did at some point and will hold a grudge and there's nothing you can do about that. Yeah. Yeah. Which I know is not a, a pleasant place to be for a lot of people. But I think what's interesting is when you say it brings, that's the invitation in. So for somebody who's prone to this problem, where it catches fire and then the cycle starts. Yeah. It's, you know, that creates, you know, it's a state of distress. Clearly I experience emotions and embarrassment and shame and, Oh my God, I can't believe I did that. And it, it's that yeah. icky feeling. Yeah. The icky feeling is a state of distress. And if you live in a world where you cannot allow a state of distress, you are going to quickly try to solve that problem an unsolvable mm -hmm. problem to make sure that I cannot, I cannot allow that. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's such and a good point. Sorry, go ahead. No, whether it's just the feeling that those emotions will be too much. The two things I hear is the one mm -hmm. that you were talking about. What does this say about me? It is a judgment mm -hmm. about me. I am a bad person. I'm a horrible person. I'm unlovable or big emotions are too much. I cannot mm -hmm. handle big, big emotions. So mm, got to figure this out and stop it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like the, the idea, one of the core fears in, in the realm of OCD that's talked about is this idea of ruining, right? Like, and I, I think the idea that my, and that, so this is a little bit different from what you were just talking about with it being like, this is too much. I can't possibly feel this when it comes mm -hmm. up, but this idea that like, and now I've ruined my life and now it's permanently marked and there's just no way of, of getting back to where I was and it's going to all be horrible. Um, which I think is sort of related in a way to what yeah. you're just talking about. And I think everybody probably has that feeling as well. It's just a matter of degree. Sometimes everybody's mm -hmm. going to have that feeling. I can't change that as much as I wish I had done this differently. I can't, I can't do it differently now. So it's not perfect the way I wanted this to turn out. Yeah. And so it becomes a matter of how willing are we to tolerate that in the end? Yes, it is. Absolutely. It. Can we let that just sort of hang out with us? One thing I liked that you said maybe a couple of minutes ago was that the idea of this is a problem that can't be resolved. No. And I, I think a lot of OCD and anxiety falls into that category, but in some instances, it's particularly clear that there's no certain to be, certainty to be had or no resolution to be had. And I think this is certainly one of those cases. If something has happened that you're that you have guilt around or sh shame around, like you, you cannot change the event. That's not possible. And no amount of going back through it and trying to rationalize and reason with yourself as to why you're allowed to forgive yourself is actually going to change the event. And spoiler alert, you're not actually going to talk yourself into feeling as though you deserve to be forgiven. No, never. It's not going to happen. Mm -mm. Yeah, no matter how hard you think, I, I will share a quick anecdote, anecdote of somebody who took it to such an extreme, and this person has spoken publicly about it, so I think I'm okay saying this without saying a name, yeah. took it to such an extreme that they started digging into the other worlds, the many worlds theories in, in quantum uh -oh. physics yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to try and find solace in the idea that in, in other parallel universes where mm -hmm. the quantum waveform collapsed differently, that event did not happen and it did not ruin them and they are thought of as a, as a great person instead of the villain in someone's story. They, they oh. really, and they dug, dug, dug into that. Is that true? Is that actually true? Have we proved that that's true? It became wow. an obsession to prove that the, uh, the many worlds theory is true. So that they knew that in some version of the universe that didn't happen. That's how, wow. that's how that can go off the rails. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, but it does sort of also speak to the element of what beautiful minds we have right? Like the, that you can, that, that that is the connection that's drawn there, the ideas, the creativity behind that. I, if I could just resolve it, but it, by proving this theory, you know, um, not a lot of people would come to that. I don't think. Yeah. That's incredibly creative thinking Totally, but that's, to me, a great example of how we bring, and this is a thing that comes out of ACT and uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, where we, we pathologize problems and we think that life is a series of problems that need to be solved. And we bring to power, the, we bring to bear this incredible power that mm. isn't meant for that. Right. And it becomes a weapon instead of a tool. Like that's incredibly creative thinking and a lot of connections. And it's amazing testament yeah. to the human mind, but then it becomes a weapon against yourself when you try to look at life as a series of problems to be solved, which it is not. Right. And that's where the idea, not to go too off, uh, off uh, the beaten track here, but that's where the idea of the obsessive, the obsessive mind came from, right? Is like, how do you operate the obsessive mind? It's not changing and it's not bad, but any tool set or skill set that is universally applied isn't going to be effective in all instances. It's, that's going to start to become problematic. So if you, if you have the operating manual and you know what, where your strengths and weaknesses are, and you can kind of deal when you get hooked and you, you, you wanted to go, want to go into problem solving mode, then, then you get to appreciate the parts of your brain that are extraordinary. Yeah. 
if, if you're not tortured by them. And I, I don't, I hate to use the word tortured, but that's people, I'm just tortured by this. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. So I, I guess let's leave the uh, last five minutes to probably answer the question everybody's been waiting for. Well, then what am I supposed to do with this? How do I overcome this? I can't stop thinking about this. I can't stop trying to solve the problem. What do I do? Mm. Cause I know they're going to ask, what do I do? How do I overcome that? How do I just stop thinking about this? Mm. Yeah. Well, and you've already answered it. Haven't you? I think. Well, you can't just stop thinking about it. That's the first like technical answer. Like, yes, man to never think about it again will guarantee that you will think about it. We just know that now. That's just the way it's it goes. So cruel. It's so cruel. It's bad. It's a bad design. It's a good design, but it's a it's a bad design. <laughs> Sorry. Bad design. Can I tell you? Now, there's there are some flaws in the in in the the design for sure. Yeah. Uh, and that, yeah, that is one of them. Um, yes, yeah, so we know that trying not to think about it is not going to be an effective option for sure. And so it's down to how do we make space to live alongside the thoughts without necessarily picking them up mm -hmm. and futzing with them, right? Like, can you just let the the sort of internal clutter of your mind be there instead of like, nope, I need to make sure that everything goes back in its place. And then of course things don't have a place and it's a, you know, yeah. it's a mess. And so in the end, the alleviate, because everybody's after the, the alleviation of the discomfort. Like I want to get out of that state of distress that, that this triggers. And in the end, it's, it's going through the state of distress. That's the only way to do it. And I think sometimes when people ask the question, but how do I overcome this? It's an incredulity, like, wait a minute, you can't possibly mean that I have to simply allow myself to feel like an awful person. Mm -hmm. Well, but sadly, yeah, you kind of do. Like, Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the only, the only addition I will make, because people will say like, am I supposed to feel like a horrible person forever? Oh. I'm like, no, and I'm not saying you, but no, you know what I mean? Right, but right, people, right. Then, I'm, then I go, well, that's like a horrible feel person is not a feeling, it's a judgment. So what are you actually feeling? Are you feeling anxious? Are you feeling guilty? Are you feeling um, whatever? And then that's something that we can work with because I can help you sit with that. I can also help you acknowledge and, and sit with the fact that that, that thought is over there. Um, but if it's, I'm, I have to sit with this fact that I'm a horrible, or the idea that I'm a horrible person, you know, we're almost feeding into it being some sort of a, a truth. Yeah. So that means that's a good, that's a really good, I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, that means I just have to be horrible forever. No, but you have to be willing to allow the possibility that you are in fact horrible. Yes. And because when you try to run from that, it's very, it's like quicksand, yeah. which I thought would be a much, I know this is an old joke, but I thought it would be a much larger problem in the world based on what I saw as a kid. <laughs> and it turned out it I've never encountered quicksand, but it's like quicksand. The more you struggle, the more you sink. And yeah. so the more you try to get away from that state of distress, the more you are glued to it. But when you stop and allow it to be there, you get to actually, it sits in a chair next to you and you can push the chair away. It's on casters a little bit and make space and like, okay, I, I, I can coexist with this. And then it doesn't feel like it's going to be forever. Right. Because then you get to have the natural ebb and flow of it where it comes right. sometimes and then you're taken off guard by it and you're like, oh, right. There, that, that thing happened. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, well. So, I mean, unfortunately, we haven't given you, uh, if you're watching and you're hoping we were going to give you the, these are three steps. Here are three hacks to like overcome relationship, you know, R-E-O-C-D. -E Sorry. Like we're never going to do that video. No, I was going to say, uh, I think all of our videos will be a disappointment to the person who's looking for that. Kind of. Uh, but I think that there's also a really beautiful silver lining here, which is that you walk out of it going, okay, like it's none of life is that simple. None of it. So I could either fight for these categories of good and bad and, you know, right and wrong, or I, I could just make space for the fact that like life is a freaking mess and that, and that's uncomfortable. That's, that is definitely uncomfortable not yeah. having that sort of organization around it all. Oh yeah, I agree hundred percent. But you know, the other thing too, is the realization that life is a hot mess for everybody. Mm -hmm. That's another act principle there that like hmm. suffering in air quotes or, or adversity is a universal experience for human beings. Totally. Like, yeah. We don't get a choice. That's what we're in. So, yep. you know, trying to make sure it never happens is really a sure way to suffer even more. So 
I actually, I have a quote by Ricky Gervais that I'll have to share with you that, um, that sort of talks about, uh, about the idea that it's all like all of us are in it and this sort of suffering. Hold on. Actually, can I share? Yeah. Hell yeah. Sure. You I can. have it really quite readily available. It must be a good quote. That's actually, the only... there, are, there are two. I was sharing it. A friend told me about it. I found one and his are sort of like, <laughs> well, cause we know uh, Ricky Gervais is a little bit, you know, salty. Um, <laughs> so one of them is saltier than the other. Um, Bring it. But the one I found, the first one was, I believe that life is like a holiday, I guess. We don't exist, exist for like a 13 and a half billion years. And then we have 80 to 90 years, which is an amazing experience. Consciousness, you know, fun, wine, dogs, cats, all the amazing things in life. Then we die and we never exist again. Now, some people don't believe that, even though I think that that's all we've got. I still think that the quality of life is what matters. And I think we have a lot of responsibility. We have to pay our way and enjoy ourselves without hurting other people. And I just, uh, and I think to leave the world even just a little better. If you stay in someone's caravan or apartment, uh, everyone knows that you should leave it as you found it or a little bit better, leave it just a little bit better. And I want to be in the balance. I want to leave my corner of the world as nice as I found it, if not a little bit better, that is all. Um, and I, I think that the idea of, you know, we get 80 to 90 years and, you know, I think I wanted to bring it up because it's like, and, it's going to be full of really hard things, which he's talking about the fun and the wine and the dogs and the cats. But it's uh, he implied here is that you're going to be on a roller coaster mm -hmm. and you got to enjoy it or not. Um, the other one is <laughs> we are on a rock traveling around one of 100 billion stars. Our species is one of over half a billion that have ever existed. Our chances of being born are about one in 400 trillion. You're not special but you are lucky. Enjoy your amazing life. You'll never exist again. <laughs> that's, that's, I, I really like that one. That one's really good. <laughs> well, it's, it's got his like true pithy sort of. <laughs> yeah. 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 Character. No, that's, that's actually really good. Your odds of being here are astronomically against. So yeah. Yeah. So. Let's be thankful that we're here, I guess. I know easier said than done. The thing I, one of the things I dig about the, the first quote too is, there's some philosophy in there. And so leave the leave the world at least as good as the way you found it. And in a way, we get to contribute. So this conversation, people are going to listen to us. They might talk to somebody else. And navigating through the shit and the uncertainty and the distress, believe it or not, we're sort of adding to the collective wisdom, the collective knowledge. People that come after us will stand on our shoulders and, and know that one day Lauren sat in her big black chair and said, you got to surf through the shit. And it was, and somebody will benefit from that. So we are all contributing in a way. The, yeah. There's a point to a certain extent in the struggle. I don't want to romanticize it, but there's also silver linings in it. No, actually, I love, I love that. And I, I, I think that that's the, the benefit of, of having gone through what we've been through and, and coming here to try and support others. And yeah, you, you make what, with what you're given, what you can. Yeah. Uh, and it's not to sugarcoat it. And yeah, obviously you're going to have moments where it's like, yeah, but I, I didn't leave my corner of the world better off and I'm bad. And therefore I deserve to punish myself uh, uh, unendingly for the next however many years. Um, but what's interesting is you could do that, or maybe you spend your life just trying to be the kind of person that you want to be. Yeah, that works. And sometimes you, you make it and sometimes you don't. Some days yeah. you're really good at being you and some days we suck at being us. It's okay. Yeah. It's all allowed. It's all part of the part of the deal. It is. All right. So there you go. We've solved no problem for anybody. But <laughs> I, I, no, I, honestly, though, I, I, hopefully it's been a, a fruitful discussion to listen into and maybe you'll take something out of it and have things to think about, even though thinking sometimes is the problem. Things to reflect on, let's say that. Yeah, so. I like that. Yeah, I always appreciate these chats that we have. Um, Likewise. Yeah, we will keep doing them. So I guess we're done. We've gone a little further than we usually do at 34 minutes. So good. But for those of you who do not follow Lauren on social media, you totally should. And I got it right. And here to think about it. There she is. So at, at the Obsessive Mind on Instagram is probably the best place. And also yep. your website, theobsessivemind.com, right? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. I'm going to get a little bit more into the YouTube world, maybe. All right. Come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it is. 
<laughs> is through and he's got a thing that he's going to put up and that's his handle on Instagram. You can find him there or on many other places, his website, which also your podcast is on your website or do you have a different? Yeah. Web, yeah. No, they're all there. The anxious and truth. Then, ang the anxious truth .com. And yeah. Then, uh, yeah, all over Thanks Amazon stuff. too, with all his books and stuff, like just, you know, crushing life. I am all over Amazon. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> well, if you're watching with us live on YouTube like we do, thanks for hanging out with us for sure. And uh, keep commenting. We'll try and answer them the best we can. If you're watching in the future, leave a new comment. We'll try and answer the best we can. So thanks a bunch. Yep. Thanks. All right. We're out.